This video is part of an audiobook series featuring The Creative Curve, How to Develop the Right Idea at the Right Time by Alan Gannett. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel or my website for downloads. Chapter 9. Law number 3. Creative Communities. The popular image of the creative genius is that of a brilliant neurotic who accomplishes superhuman feats of creativity on their own, alone, in a metaphorical cabin somewhere. This image has filtered up from decades if not centuries of popular culture. In the Iron Man cartoon and the subsequent movie Empire, Tony Stark is a singular genius. He runs a massive corporate empire and builds his own robotic Iron Man suits. But this idea exists beyond fiction. Tesla in SpaceX's Elon Musk is routinely compared to Tony Stark. That said, it's pretty clear that the mythology around the self-reliant genius makes little sense. Elon Musk employs thousands of people who enable him to create futuristic technology. Hundreds of years ago, Mozart spent countless hours learning from his teachers and also sought out numerous collaborators. Even though over the course of writing this book, I found that creativity is very much a team sport, our cultural mythology, at least in the United States, remains extremely focused on the individual. I plead guilty myself. Most of the stories I am telling you are about individual people and not really about the groups surrounding them. But ignoring the social aspect of creativity has dire consequences. Studies show that building a community of people around us is essential to achieving world-class success. One study from the University of California analyzed the social networks of more than 2,000 scientists and inventors. The research demonstrated that an, invent an innovator's network could predict prominence, productivity, and even the length of their career. Another study found that a wide range of world-class performers, ranging from artists to athletes, had all studied at one time under a relentless and experienced teacher. Yet another study of successful artists found that the strength of an artist's reputation was correlated to the number of relationships they had with other successful artists, both within and beyond their own generations. This is not as simple as saying you need collaborators. I found that creatives had four different types of people in their networks. A master teacher, a conflicting collaborator, a modern muse, and a prominent promoter. Each one of these roles is filled either by an individual or by a group of people. No role is more essential than another. With only one of these roles absent, a person's creative success becomes less likely. Together, these form what I call a creative community, a community of people who directly and indirectly affect a person's creative process. These creative communities are one of the most important and yet least studied aspects of creativity. In my interviews, I found that not only are these four roles essential, but I learned how creatives found or attracted these vital people. Over the next few pages, we will answer two critical questions. Why are these people so important? And, more to the point, how can we find them? Let's start by turning on the radio. A Master Teacher Taylor Swift's album 1989 has sold over 10.1 million copies to date. It has had three number one singles and is considered one of the most successful records of the past decade. When you think of Taylor Swift, her Coca-Cola ad might come to mind. Taylor is backstage writing her hit song 22, strumming guitar chords and scratching out the lyrics in her diary. She exhibits an organic, sweat-free creativity. But when you scan the linear notes, or nowadays, or the liner notes, the internet, you will find a different story. Almost all of Swift's songs have co-writers, her trio of number one singles from the album, all three were co-written by Max Martin and Shellback. Who is Max Martin, and who is Shellback, and does he really have no last name? You could call Martin a hit doctor, but that would be a vast understatement of both his success and his talents. NPR once dubbed him the Scandinavian secret behind all your favorite songs. Martin is in fact the king of modern pop, ranking third for the most number one singles ever, after John Lennon and Paul McCartney. These include Katy Perry's I Kissed a Girl, Pink's So What, Maroon 5's One More Night, and 19 others, although by the time this book is published, that number will have risen. Shellback works for Martin and is one of the dozens of songwriters who either work for Martin or by trained by him in his method. For example, Martin taught Dr. Luke, 
who has written hits for Tao Cruz and Kelly Clarkson. He also taught Salvin Savin Kotecha, who's responsible for numerous chart toppers for the boy band darlings, One Direction. Other Martin protégés are Benny Blanco, who was mentored by Dr. Luke and is thus an intellectual grandson of Martin. Blanco went on to write number one singles for Justin Bieber and Maroon 5. The scale of Martin's influence is evident when you look at the Billboard number one singles from 2014 to 2016. Over the course of those three years, there were 29 number one singles in all. Of those, 21% were either written or co-written by Max Martin, and another 7% were composed by a Martin protege. This means that nearly one in every three chart-topping Billboard singles was composed by a small group of friends and colleagues. Those are just the number one singles. That doesn't include all the other high-performing songs that Martin and company wrote that merely cracked the top 10 or top 100. How is one small group of songwriters able to dominate a creative field? Max Martin's talent resides not just in his great ears, but in the fact that he taught others his songwriting methods. Asked at a conference what makes a pop a great pop song, Arnthor Biggerson, Biggis, Bergeson, a songwriter who has written for Santana, Celine Dion, and Janet Jackson, and was mentored by Martin, explained that the older Swede taught him a formula. Among his elements, quote, Never use more than three melodic parts in a song. Three parts and recycle parts of the verse or part of the song in the chorus, so when the chorus comes, you already heard the chorus, but it's the beginning of the verse. End quote. Max not only teaches his protégés the constraints and formulas that come together to create a familiar pop song, he also helps them perfect their craft. As I wrote earlier in my section on deliberate practice, learning from an experienced teacher and getting feedback from them is an essential step in developing and honing a creative skill. Bonnie McKee is a lyricist who worked with Martin and many of the people in his group. She's co-written the words to songs including Dynamite by Tao Cruz, California Girls by Katy Perry, and countless others. Interviewed by The New Yorker, she said of writing lyrics for Max Martin, quote, It's very mathematical. A line has to have a certain number of syllables, and the next line has to be its mirror image, end quote. Mathematics, it turns out, is a core element of writing a great pop song. Martin, in fact, has referred to his creative process as melodic math. His reasoning is straightforward. As McKee said, quote, People like hearing songs that sound like something they've heard before, that's reminiscent of their childhood and of what their parents listened to, end quote. Or, as we might say it, they like to hear things that are familiar. Martin also provided McKee with the feedback she needed to improve her skill. Quote, I can write something that I think is so clever, but if it doesn't hit the ear right, then Max doesn't like it. End quote, says McKee. Master teachers like Max Martin are essential to the creative process. What makes people like Martin masters is that they've achieved the level of success beyond the typical experienced practitioner. Jonathan Hardesty, the painter, found a master teacher at the atelier he attended in South Dakota. Andrew Ross Sorkin became friends with older, wiser authors. Master teachers serve two essential roles. They teach constraints, and they teach and they assist with deliberate practice through feedback. Absorbing these constraints in turn allows students to make progress more rapidly as they refine their own skills. Back in the early 1980s, a researcher studied the lives of 120 high achievers, ranging from mathematicians to sculptors to athletes. The goal of the study was to trace the lives of high achievers back through their earliest years in order to uncover what common elements, if any, led to their ultimate success. The researchers' findings were published in a book, Developing Talent in Young People. One key finding, across all fields, every individual in his study had at one time been taught by a master teacher. So how do you attract a master teacher? Do you just snap your fingers? In search of an answer, I went to L.A. to visit a rock star turned investor who is friends with everyone from billionaire grocery store magnates to the hip-hop superstars that dominate today's charts. Learning Patterns for Young Guns and Billionaires D.A. Wallach is a 33-year-old redhead whose mentors include everyone from Farrell Williams and P. Diddy, whom Wallach calls Puff Daddy, to Weezer's Rivers Cuomo. 
Wallach and I are sitting on the patio outside his halfway renovated home on a foggy morning in the Hollywood Hills. I am characteristically chipper. Wallach pulled up into his driveway only minutes before and is even more cheerful than I am, laughing at all my jokes, which are not funny. Wallach is a hybrid artist-musician-investor. Before turning his talents to companies, Wallach was the lead singer of the one-time indie darling Chester French, a band formed while he was still an undergraduate at Harvard. Around the time he graduated, the band was a target of a bidding war between Kanye West and Farrell, both gunning to sign them to their record labels. Ultimately, Wallach and his band signed with Farrell's label, where they released the album Love the Future. The band eventually fizzled out, yet Wallach still remains a part of the music world. He was Spotify's artist-in-residence for a while, helping the startup build better relationships with musicians. He also played a minor role as a singer in 2017's hit movie, La La Land. Alongside his musical and artistic career, Wallach has also invested in companies ranging from Spotify to SpaceX. Despite not being your stereotypical blue dress shirt finance type of guy, today he is partner at Inevitable Futures, a fund he co-founded with billionaire grocery store mogul Ron Burkle, which invests in high-growth tech companies. How did this young former band member get connected to rap icons, billionaires, and tech unicorns? Wallach credits a large part of his success to the peoples he's learned from. Quote, It's always been me feeling someone has all the answers and then kind of latching on to them and hoping that they'll teach me. End quote. At Harvard, he found, that, he found out that Weezer's lead singer, Rivers Cuomo, was on break from touring and going to Harvard as a student. Wallach dug up Cuomo's email in the student directory and reached out cold to see if the two of them could meet. Soon, they were grabbing dinner at the dining hall, and Wallach was learning about the music industry from one of modern rock's most famous talents. Wallach has continued to seek out teachers, adding, quote, I've had a series of people who I also forced to be my mentors. 90% of my day is just asking questions, end quote. The key, he says, is learning to be curious. The point is, don't wait for someone to take you under their wing. Initiate the process yourself. If you meet someone who is successful in a field that you want to learn about, approach them. Be curious. Be relentless. As Wallach and others found out, most people are happy and willing to share their experience and knowledge. All you have to do is ask them. Nor do you have to be young and green to need a master teacher or mentor. In fact, many of the most established people I interviewed have what are known as reverse mentors. David Rubenstein, the co-founder and co-CEO of Carlyle Group, one of the largest private equity firms in the world with $158 billion under management, has a reported net worth of $2.5 billion. In addition, Rubenstein sits on over 30 nonprofit boards, of which he chairs seven, including the Kennedy Center, the Smithsonian Institution, and the Council on Foreign Relations. He also hosts The David Rubenstein Show on Bloomberg TV, where he interviews people ranging from Oprah to Bill Gates. We are sitting together on an outdoor patio in Aspen, Colorado, during the annual Aspen Ideas Fe Festival, one of those big idea conferences that lures everyone from renowned ballet dancers to financial titans. Rubenstein orders mint tea, and we discuss how he goes about learning things. What I'm most struck most by is that for a man in his 60s who has amassed billions, Rubenstein sounds remarkably similar to D.A. Wallach. Quote, I like to meet people who are very smart, who know something about areas that I don't know. I spend a lot of time asking questions, end quote. Like Wallach, Rubenstein has a question-based conversation style. He's always pushing for more information. Quote, it's easy for me to ask people questions, and I like to find people who can tell me something that I don't know, end quote. Soon, his laser-like approach turns on me. Quote, do you know something I should know? You're the expert on big data, end quote. This pattern kept reappearing in my interviews. Kevin Ryan, the serial internet entrepreneur we met in an earlier chapter, told me that he, too, focuses on learning from people with niche knowledge. Quote, a successful meeting for me is when I'm speaking 30% of the time, because I don't learn anything if I'm speaking all the time, end quote. Ryan may have started multiple nine- and ten-figure valuation companies, but he is still primarily interested in learning from others. Quote, 
I had a great conversation yesterday with the friend of my daughter who's 16 and has a whole bunch of theories on education and different education systems. You can learn from anyone, end quote. As I continued interviewing people, I found that many of the most successful people I spoke to were also the most open and the most willing to create moments of learning and vulnerability. How do you create those moments? The best moment I found out, or the best method I found out, is to bring novel people into your orbit. Ryan, for one, accomplishes this through food. Quote, one of the ways I do this is through dinner parties. We will try to have someone in politics, someone from an internet company, and some random people, end quote. If you dislike entertaining, another idea is to invite a coworker out for coffee, or simply say yes the, num- the next time some precocious college student asks to pick your brain. Now, if you're successful already, it can be far easier to bring people into your network. But what if you're just starting out? We can't all get into Harvard and rub shoulders with rock stars in philosophy class. Clustered. A young woman was sweeping the lobby of the Park Hotel in the Soma section of San Francisco, the neighborhood south of Market Street. The lobby had muted green walls with benches that looked ripped out of a diner. It wasn't truly a hotel. Rather, it was affordable housing with shared bathrooms. As she continued sweeping, she noticed a photographer snapping a picture. Over 35 years later, the resulting photo appeared as part of a photo series on the gentrification of Soma. Since that time, San Francisco and Soma in particular has gone from impoverished to unaffordable. Office space in the formerly run-down Soma neighborhood now rents for an average of $72.50 per square foot, matching pricey Manhattan, and studio apartments sell for an average of over $1,200 per square foot, which means that a small 450-square-foot studio costs more than $540,000, which is enough to buy a McMansion in many suburbs. As for the Park Hotel, it has turned into a techie commune where aspiring entrepreneurs and software engineers can rent minuscule rooms for $1,000 a month. So why are people moving there in droves? Somewhere along the way, Soma turned into one of the epicenters of the startup industry. In its immediate vicinity, you'll find the headquarters of Twitter, Salesforce, Pinterest, and Zynga, as well as offices for major companies including Google, Yelp, and Adobe. As more and more tech companies migrate to the neighborhood, more people seem to want to follow their path. Engineers want to be near other engineers. CEOs want to be near other CEOs. Sociologists call this effect clustering. For decades, Richard Florida, best known for his book, The Rise of the Creative Class, has been studying the impact that density has on creativity. In one study, he and a research team studied over 240 metropolitan areas and compared the density of creative workers to the number of patents, a reflection of the level of innovation. They found that as density increased and creative people found themselves more tightly packed, the number of patents also went up. Florida explained to me how big this impact was, quote, places with high degrees of creative density were six times more innovative than places with low levels of creative density, end quote. It wasn't simply about high numbers of creatives in one geographical area. To spur them to best innovate, you needed them right on top of one another. The reason to has to do with what academics are calling knowledge spillover. This is the process by which ideas are shared among people and institutions as they meet, network, and talk to one another. When an artist lets it drop to another artist that they have discovered a new technique, or a researcher mentions to another researcher a new technology, or to an entrepreneur, the knowledge transfers or spills to another person in the network. In essence, the teaching process is ongoing and everlasting. Density is not only useful for finding teachers and mentors, but also collaborators. Says Florida, quote, in a great urban area, there are lots of talented people competing and collaborating, combining and recombining, forming and reforming with one another. Out of that very Darwinian process, out of that Darwinian profit motive, you begin to get great success. For these spillovers to happen, face-to-face relationships are also critical. It's not enough for people to know each other. Close physical proximity means that you and I bump into each other at the corner coffee shop or while we're waiting for the bus, which gives us ample opportunities for impromptu meetings. 
To become members of this environment, we are willing to pay premium prices to live and work in places like Soma. Sure, the architecture is unique and there are some historic buildings, but the big driver is that the people who, want, who we want to learn from live there. Membership in a cluster like Soma is essential to finding a master teacher. Now, it goes without saying that not everyone can afford to move to one of these dense overpriced areas, but visiting, commuting, or spending as much time as you can there is essential to accessing the teachers who can accelerate creative success. Once you find yourself there, the mechanism for finding teachers is straightforward, curiosity. Be like Wallach and ask questions. Make it clear that you want to learn. Successful people tend to admire this quality and will be more willing to take you under their wing. If you're already experienced, find people who know something specific that you don't know and ask them questions. Kevin Ryan may have created billions of dollars in value, but he still aims to speak only 30% of the time in a meeting. If you do this, you increase the odds of finding one or more master teachers, the first of, th of the four necessary members of your creative community. These teachers will show you the patterns and formulas of your field so you don't have to start from scratch. They will also give you the feedback you need to master your craft more quickly, just as Max Martin did with his team of protégés. The science of deliberate practice suggests that we all need to learn from someone more advanced than we are. But it's not enough to just learn the craft, eventually we also have to create something. The next member of your creative community is essential for executing your ideas. Conflicting Collaborators Brenda Chapman's mother drew a line on a piece of paper. Actually, it might be better described as a scribble. She turned to four-year-old Brenda and asked her to make something out of it. Could Brenda learn to see things for more than what they appeared to be? The little girl gazed down at the scribble and began connecting lines. She added a nose. She added ears, well, an approximation of ears, and drew a smile. She paused and looked at her work. It's a dog! It didn't look like a dog, but her mother beamed anyway. Brenda was being creative. She was making something out of nothing. Before long, these games sparked a passion in Brenda Chapman. She would race home after school to draw and to watch hour after hour of Bugs Bunny cartoons. Wherever she was, she would be illustrating little scenes and characters. In Illinois, both the winters and the rainy seasons were long, and when cabin fever hit, Brenda with the assistance of a large blanket, would transform the coffee table in her family's living room into a fort. She snuck under, under it, lay on her back, and started drawing on the other side of the table. Her mother never caught her drawing on the family furniture. Only when the family moved did Brenda's no mother notice the figures drawn on the wood, but even if she had, she would not have been upset. The important thing was that her daughter was pursuing her passions. Soon, Brenda announced that she wanted to become an animator. All those cartoons she watched after school and all those sketches she made became her new calling. In a blink, she was attending California Institute of the Arts and plotting her way into a career in animation. Her mother didn't know it, but for Brenda Chapman, those early illustration games would turn into a record-breaking animation career. Brenda would become the head of story for The Lion King, the first woman to hold a, a head of story role in a major studio animated film. And from there, go on to co-direct DreamWorks, The Prince of Egypt, becoming the first woman to direct a major studio animated film. She later shattered another glass ceiling as a writer and director of Disney Pixar's Brave, becoming the first female winner of the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature. Creating worlds is where Brenda Chapman feels most, feels most comfortable. As we spoke via video conference, one thing she made clear to me is that creating a movie is about as far as you can get from a solo process. In fact, as far as Brenda is concerned, part of what makes a successful movie is the collaboration of multiple talented voices. Animated movies require story artists, animators, producers, screenwriters, directives, or directors, studio executives, and of course, marketers. The process is iterative, and everyone gives one another feedback. These distinct voices working together allows for the broadest possible perspective on what movie audiences will enjoy. Story artists, for example, draw a series of select frames and create a crucial comic book version of the movie long before the animation team starts working. According to Chapman, this allows the director, quote, 
to discover the characters and who they are and how they behave and what their emotional arc is. Is the story working? Are the themes right? Is the pacing right? It's really the preliminary blueprint, and the story artists are writing and acting and drawing at the same time. End quote. Yes, Chapman was the director, but she still has gaps in her skills and knowledge. After all, Chapman is a story artist turned director, not an audio engineer or a marketer. Without other people around to execute those responsibilities, she wouldn't be able to accomplish her directorial and creative vision. In most creative work, then, collaborators are, use are essential. While this may seem obvious, when I interviewed creators, what surprised me was what type of collaborators were most effective. To unravel this, I talked to two young creatives who, it just so happened, were having an excellent year. Stop, collaborate, and listen. Benj Pasek is exuberant, to the point where over the phone he sounds as though he is bouncing up and down. By contrast, Justin Paul is quiet, thoughtful, and prone to pausing before answering a question. Though potentially inharmonious, together the two form the aptly named and highly successful songwriting duo Pasek and Paul. They wrote the lyrics for 2017's hit movie La La Land, winning a Golden Globe and Academy Award for their efforts. Two weeks before I interviewed them, they won a Tony Award for their musical Dear Evan Hansen, which has become the permanently sold-out Please Find Me Tickets Broadway show of the year. The two became friends in college ba ballet class, sharing a common trait, a complete lack of coordination. As Pasek recalls, quote, We hid behind each other in class and figured out distractions so the teacher wouldn't pay attention to us, end quote. When Pasek and Paul first met, Pasek realized that Paul was a great piano player and recruited him to help fix some pop songs Pasek had written in high school. Soon, they began spending hours inside a tiny practice room on campus. Something clicked, and, as Paul recalls, before we knew it, we were writing songs together. The following year, they both tried and failed to land leading parts in the school musical. Pasek was cost, cast as the man with camera, and Paul as coroner slash backup dancer. Frustrated, they, decide to, they decided to make their own show, Edges, a collection of songs about finding meaning in your life. The rest of the cast consisted of the students who hadn't landed leading roles in the official school musical. Edges was not just a means of killing time. A video version of their performance posted on Facebook went viral, and soon, school groups around the country were requesting permission to perform Edges. As a result, the duo quickly came to be seen as, a, as the future of musical theater. Celebrated producers wanted to mentor them, the press adored them. Still, what was it that Pasek and Paul saw in each other? What made their partnership work? For Benj, Justin Paul provided the structure he needed to channel his ideas into a finished product. Quote, Justin is very rigorous in his approach to his creative process, his approach to how he lives his life and how he likes to organize the time. End quote. To Pasek, this sort of systematic thinking is invaluable. Quote, Without him, I wouldn't put as much importance on it. And I have learned how valuable that is to be able to create that kind of structure for oneself and for a creative process. End quote. For his part, Pasek, the big thinker, dreamer, wanderer, needed Paul, the planner, tinkerer, homebody. The process of creating a musical is seldom straightforward, and the Pasek Paul dynamic and partnership allowed them both to flourish. Often, early productions take place outside of New York City. If they do well in a secondary market, only then might they move off-Broadway. Dear Evan Hansen began its life in a theater in Washington, D.C. The local press gave it rave reviews, but there was one problem. The final song of the first act didn't leave the audience with a feeling of dramatic tension. Worse, the song, A Part of Me, wasn't exactly optimistic, and some even deemed it judgmental. For the off-Broadway production, Pasek and Paul auditioned a new song, Surrounded, but that one didn't work either. Paul wanted to create something better, but how? He was stuck. That's when he called on Pasek, who began brainstorming, covering three pages of a journal with phrases. For Paul, this deluge of ideas was exactly what he needed. Quote, Whether it's a bunch of great ideas or nine bad ideas and one great idea, it's helpful to just start the ideas flowing just to get things out there and start the process. Sometimes I get so paralyzed in seeing all the problems, end quote. 
From experience, Paul knows that his preoccupation with process can land him in a rut. He needs a collaborator who can spark new ideas. Without Pasek, Paul tells me, quote, I'm prone to submit to being creatively stumped, end quote. In the journal, one phrase caught Paul's eye, you will be found. That phrase ended up as the title of Dear Evan Hansen's Act One final song. What's more, says Pasek, quote, it became a really big theme throughout the entire show of how do we save ourselves and how do we believe that we'll be okay, end quote. When Dear Evan Hansen premiered on Broadway, one line in the New York Times review felt especially sweet. Quote, particularly memorable is the soaring anthem that closes the, fir- the first act and is reprised in the second, You Will Be Found, end quote. By providing the other with something that person can't do alone, Pasek and Paul have achieved outsize and ongoing success. Having said that, collaboration is rarely all bliss. Sometimes, the, men, the two men's differing perspectives cause friction. But rather than ending in compromise or a weakened, muddled outcome, Paul believes that, that their dueling perspectives make things better than if either one of them was working alone. Quote, It's not just meeting in the middle, it's pushing forward so that instead of just moving on that horizontal plane, we're moving vertically as well. End quote. For this reason, I call the ideal person to work with a conflicting collaborator. Basically, you don't want to collaborate with someone who is so easy to get along with that they don't push you. The goal is to find a person who will help you discover and overcome your flaws. Ideal collaborators balance out each other's weaknesses and provide different perspectives. Creativity, after all, is a team sport, and even if you lack a close working partner like Benj Pasek or Justin Paul, other collaborators are out there. Pasek and Paul, for example, worked with a writer who wrote the dialogue for Dear Evan Hansen, as well as with a director, a producer who secured financing, not to mention a stellar cast of actors and singers. In talent-dense environments, it's a lot easier to find a conflicting collaborator. For Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, that environment was a college with a strong theater program. For ben- Brenda Chapman, it was Cal Arts in Los Angeles. Many of the romance writers I spoke with found collaborators through a group called the Romance Writers of America, who offered not only friendship, but also feedback and editing help. The internet, of course, has made collaboration and finding your tribe a lot more convenient. Online, the painter Jonathan Hardesty got suggestions and advice from his followers on a message board. Other creative people find collaborators extremely close to home. When Brenda Chapman launched her new production company, her partner was a talented former Disney animator, Kevin Lima, who also happened to be her husband. Having a master teacher and a conflicting collaborator might seem to cover a lot of ground, but that doesn't mean your creative community is now complete. There are two other community members you need. One is a modern muse, an individual or a group of people who continually inspire and motivate you. If you devote your life to a creative profession, inevitably you will hit a few lows. Finding a support system that gets you through these rough spots will restore your energy and optimism and make you that much more likely to achieve world-class success. Moreover, these muses often provide material and raw ingredients of creativity. Best of all, they don't have to be purely supportive either. In fact, as we will see, sometimes the best inspiration comes from friendly competition. A Modern Muse For some kids, Saturday Night Live was simply a show that their parents watched. It was for adults. But for Hari Kondavolo, Saturday Night Live was a childhood ritual, which isn't surprising as he and his friends were obsessed with comedy. We, quote, we studied it without really studying it. We didn't know we were studying it, but we were watching SNL, taping it, rewatching it, watching Conan, taping it, rewatching it, watching stand-ups, listening to stand-up, end quote. This relentless consumption led Kendabalu to a love and deep understanding of stand-up comedy. Eventually, he combined his love of comedy with an equally deep passion for social justice to produce a unique form of social comedy. Today, the New York Times calls him, quote, one of the most exciting political comics in stand-up today, end quote. He tours nationally, and his last album, Mainstream, Mainstream American Comic, debuted at number two on the Billboard Comedy Album chart. 
I got in touch with him because I wanted to understand the creative process of comedians. As Kandabalu walked me through the process of writing a set, I was struck by how much of his success came from the community he'd built around himself. It began when Kandabalu was young. His brother also loved comedy, and together the two were each other's as early audiences. As Kandabalu got older, he discovered that his friends were a critical part of his career as well. Quote, Sometimes I have a funny conversation with friends, and most people, when they have funny conversation with friends, move on with their lives. I write them down because that's what I do. I collect thoughts. I don't let anything go because it can be useful later. End quote. Kandabalu's friends aren't collaborators per se, yet they serve as a powerful source of inspiration. Instead, they are examples of what I call modern muses, people who provide material for a creator to use as well as practical motivation. For him, other comedians also serve this role. Kandabalu has found that when he spends time with other comedians, his passion increases. Quote, when comedians hang out together, they have a certain energy around them, end quote. The creative life is full of emotional bumps, though maybe a better word is potholes. Creative people need to have others who supply them with the energy to power through those moments. Support and inspiration are always great, but the best modern muses also push through friendly competition. Competing for Views Casey Neistat is the original viral video star. Before YouTube even existed, he was creating short videos and uploading them online. In 2003, Nysat uploaded a three-minute film about his misadventures in trying to get Apple to replace his iPod's battery. Soon, the video was picked up by the mainstream media, and Nysat's short video was seen by millions of viewers. HBO asked him to create his own show with similar content, but it lasted only one season. Feeling the brunt of mainstream rejection, Nysat went fully online, or as he puts it, I ran to the welcoming open arms of YouTube. He posted his verse videos on his life, or about his life on the site in 2010, and today has over 8.9 million subscribers, with most of his videos garnering well over a million views, and some getting as many as 20 million. Along the way, Nysat also launched a video sharing startup, Beam, that was acquired by CNN for a reported $25 million. Nysat may be the main star of his videos, but he is surrounded in life by countless creatively ambitious people. Quote, All of my friends have a career that is largely defined by their own creativity. End quote. From Nysat. This category also includes his wife, who founded and runs two jewelry companies. Being surrounded by creative energy doesn't merely motivate Nysat, it also elevates him and those around him. Quote, We all thrive on one another and it's a wonderfully beneficial relationship, end quote. Most creators like having friends with whom they engage in friendly competition. YouTube star Connor Franta explains it well, quote, Every time one of my friends or my fellow YouTubers does something interesting and unique and next level, it's so inspiring to me. It makes me more thrilled to push myself and to try to get to that level, end quote. Franta, like Nysat, has a desire shared by many creative artists to meet other people who have the same ambition. Quote, I try and surround myself with people who are doing really interesting creative things. I have friends who have number one best-selling albums on the iTunes charts. I have a friend who has a line in Aeropostal and has made $100 million. I have a friend that's won the Teen Choice Award. End quote. Surrounding yourself with other creative people, no matter their field, gives many creators the motivational boost they need to move through the lowest points of their work. The modern muse within your creative community doesn't simply inspire you via reassurance and validation. This person can also show you what is possible. For example, Connor Franta's friends demonstrated that YouTube stars don't have to stay within the lane of creating video, which paved the way for him to launch his future companies. Identifying these people can't be easy if they're already your friends. But what if you, or it can be easy if they're already friends. But what if you don't have friends like these? What if you were starting from scratch? To answer this, we'll revisit a colorful time in art history. The surprising power of renting a loft. Jeremy Deller is a well-known artist who in 2004 was awarded the prestigious Turner Prize, which recognizes important but controversial modern art. 
Once upon a time, however, Deller was a 20-year-old living in London with a recent art history degree and a fascination with Andy Warhol. Decades before the selfie generation, when Deller heard that Warhol was visiting London, he knew that he had to get a picture with him. Deller arrived at the Anthony de Ophay Gallery, and there was Warhol sitting at a table signing mementos. Deller approached Warhol, and the artist scribbled his signature on Deller's baseball cap. Afterwards, as he paced around the gallery, Deller made conversation with a man who turned out to be a friend of Warhol's. Deller ended up getting invited to join Warhol and his group later for a drink. When Deller arrived, Warhol and five of his friends were sitting around watching a comedian on a muted television set while listening to British glam rock. As drinks continued to pour through the night, Deller eventually became Warhol's artistic subject, agreeing to take absurd hats and have his picture taken. At the end of the night, Jeremy had gotten an invitation to spend uh, two weeks at the factory, Warhol's New York City studio, which also served as the gathering place for Warhol's social network. Jeremy once described the factory as an early version of today's startup offices. Quote, it was a very fun cool, funky work play environment, which is now de rigueur for tech companies like Google. There were all these interconnecting rooms, with a door that went into another building behind that was the headquarters of Interview, Warhol's magazine. So the whole studio setup was like being in Warhol's mind. You had the publishing section, filmmaking on the top, a painting studio, a business part, a dining room. He had created a world. What struck Jeremy was how social the iconic Warhol was at the factory. Quote, he was very chatty. It was intelligence gathering for him. He was always into networks and gossip, and then he would process it all into art, end quote. Deller described how Warhol surrounded himself with people with different skills who had ambition and creativity. The working environment he created at the factory is now a norm for creative people. There's a flow of people from whom you get ideas that feed into the art. Warhol had built a community of modern muses and collaborators who seemingly shared his imagination and sensibility. While most of us count as our friends those people with whom we share common past experiences, like college or our hometown, creative artists seek out individuals who are like-minded in their passion for innovation. But you don't have to be an Andy Warhol to create this type of community. Mihaly Chisholm Mihaly, the famous sociologist I wrote about earlier, continued to follow the careers of the art students from his research. At one point, he wrote of an unusual pattern among the ones who became successful. Quote, Most of the young artists we studied who met with success after graduation started their careers in a loft. The six with the highest success had all rented lofts even before they left school. So far, none of the unsuccessful former students did this. End quote. Why would this be? Sure, a loft is a great way to store canvases, but these massive spaces serve another purpose. It is a place where artists can surround themselves with collaborators, muses, and customers. Chickson and Haley also found that lofts serve as a signal to the art, art world, communicating that the artists or artists who live there are serious and interested in public recognition. In fact, one of the most essential roles of a successful loft is a party space. Chisholm and Haley writes, a loft, quote, a loft is an informal institution that artists use to get in touch with the public. A loft without parties, without visitors, a loft that is not known in artistic circles is not a loft in this institutional sense, end quote. While most of us can't afford to build a giant office studio complex like Warhol, renting an artist loft is an example of a lower cost way you can attract the necessary members of a creative community, such as modern muses. Lofts even enable artists to find the fourth and final member of the creative com community, a prominent promoter. A prominent promoter. Maria Gopit Mayer run, won the Nobel Prize in Physics, only the second woman after Marie Curie, joined the Manhattan Project in World War II, and over the course of her esteemed career published countless papers. Today, she's remembered as an academic great. Yet in 1931, at age 26, she was an unknown young researcher. How did she end up being awarded science's greatest prize? Researcher Harriet Zuckerman was fascinated by her story and those of other Nobel laureates. Zuckerman wanted to know what we could learn from the early careers of these award winners. Were there clear steps that led to future success? 
To answer this question, Zuckerman interviewed nearly every living American Nobel laureate in science. The book that produced her findings, Scientific Elite, Nobel Laureates in the United States, has become one of the greatest texts in the study of greatness. One thing Zuckerman found was that future Nobel laureates were 170% more productive during their 20s than the typical academic. The average Nobel laureate has she studied authored 7.9 papers in his or her 20s, in contrast to ordinary scientists who were credited with only 2.9. You might well be thinking, but of course, wouldn't we expect them to be smarter and harder working? After all, that's why they ended up winning the Nobel Prize. The thing is, when Zuckerman interviewed the laureates, she uncovered a different answer. In 1931, Maria Gopert Mayer was spending the summer working with the famed physicist Max Born, who would be awarded a Nobel himself in 1954. Together, the two of them authored a paper entitled Dynamic Lattice Theory of Crystals. Senior researchers often work with younger scientists, so that part comes as no surprise, but here is where the story took an unusual turn. On often, top researchers endeavors, endeavor to keep the names of younger scientists off the final paper. For younger colleagues, it's considered part of paying your dues. But most future Nobel laureates told Harriet Zuckerman that their mentors did the exact opposite. They not only shared credit, they often gave the younger scholars more credit. As Zuckerman writes, eminent masters exercised noblesse, noblesse obliged not only by lengthening the bibliographies of their younger associates, granting them joint authorship, but often by heightening the visibility of the junior contributions to the research in arranging to have their names appear first in the list of authors, end quote. In some cases, the master would even take their own name off the paper, leaving sole credit to the mentee. It turns out that it wasn't the laureates were truly twice as productive as other academics, but rather that they worked for mentors who tended to share credit. This led to what is commonly called a cumulative advantage, which is simply the idea that early advantages compound and can lead to large differences over time. By the time they reached their 30s, these young academics were better known than other researchers, making it much harder for those researchers to catch up. These future laureates had been boosted by others who were already credible. Senior researchers gave them clout and a foundation with which to build an advantage. In previous chapters, I wrote that to be considered a genius, you also need to be recognized. It's not enough to work hard or to create technically competent work. You also need social acknowledgement that you're credible. For this reason, especially, the last essential member of your creative community is a prominent promoter, someone with credibility who is willing to advocate for you and your work. This phenomenon extends far beyond science. For example, prominent promoters are often seen in the music industry. The most obvious example is how more popular acts will bring lesser-known acts on tour with them as openers. In 2006, the country band Rascal Flatts booked a teenager named Taylor Swift to open for the last nine of their shows on tour, helping to propel her to country music fame. By 2015, Swift was returning the favor, hiring the then 16-year-old Sean Mendez to open for her on the world tour. Finding a prominent promoter may sound difficult. Why would someone want to lend their credibility to you? But stories tell us that not only do mentees benefit from these relationships, but promoters do too. Is it better to be an insider or an outsider? Researchers at New York University wanted to understand the elements that make for an ideal team. Is it better to fill a team with skilled novices armed with new and fresh ideas or established players who can lend experience and creativity to a project? To learn the answer, they studied the film credits of 2,137 movies distributed by the major Hollywood movie studios between the years 1992 and 2003. For each of these films, they looked at seven critical crew members— producer, director, writer, editor, cinematographer, production designer, and composer, ultimately ending up with a list of 11,974 people. Next, using an online film industry database, they created maps of the professional networks of these same crew members. Last, in hopes of judging how creatively successful the movies were, they looked at the number of major awards that each film won. The research team wanted to find out if it's easier, if it's better to be an establishment figure, a prominent promoter, or a member of the undiscovered, 
who, knew, who needs to be promoted? The answer, it turned out, was neither. The best possible placement, the researchers concluded, was to be somewhere in the middle, that is to say, between the establishment and the fringe. The researchers found that by hugging the center, individuals can benefit from, from being directly exposed to sources of social legitimacy. At the same time, partial membership in the fringe gives them the ongoing access to novel ideas. Quote, by not losing touch with the periphery, they can access fresh new ideas that are more likely to blossom on the fringe of the network while ex escaping the conformity pressures that are typical of a more socially entrenched field. End quote. Being in the middle, between the establishment and the fringe, also helps a person create content that is familiar and credible, but also novel. Now, what if you're successful already and a member of the establishment? Alternatively, what if you're a true up-and-comer? The NYU team produced a second conclusion. Teams containing both established and up-and-coming people gain the same advantage as a person who leans to the middle. This is because people on the fringe give the establishment figures fresh ideas, and the establishment figures provide the necessary reputation and credibility. If you are already successful, this finding underscores how important it is for you to bring new and fresh voices onto your teams if you want to maximize your creative success. You need that source of novel ideas. And if you are an up-and-comer, you need a prominent promoter for recognition. What's the best way to find one? Unfortunately, this is one of the questions whose answer you might not like. Because in many cases, you must move. If you want to be in the film, TV, or music industry, you probably have to relocate to Los Angeles. If you want to be a modern or fine artist, at some point you have to head to New York. If you are an established figure who already lives in one of those cities, don't forget that by lending your credibility to a newcomer, newcomer you not only pay it forward, you also gain from the other person's fresh ideas. The Creative Community when we glimpse a famous entrepreneur, actor, musician, or poet on the cover of a magazine, it can be easy to, to subscribe once again to the lone genius theory of creativity. Yet pretty much all the high-achieving creatives I spoke with for this book had built a creative community made up of a group of people who continue to help them on their journey toward creating hits. This, these creative communities feature four types of individuals. One, a master teacher. This is the person who teaches you the patterns and formulas of your craft or industry to ensure that you create things with the right level of familiarity, while also giving you the feedback you need to hone your craft through deliberate practice. Two, a conflicting collaborator. Everyone has flaws. In order to make them non-fatal, you need to find a person or a group of individuals whose traits compensate for your flaws. Three, a modern muse. A life of creativity often involves getting your soul slapped around. You need to surround yourself with people who will motivate and inspire you to persevere, who can be a source of fresh ideas and even friendly competition as you work toward achieving your very best work. 4. A prominent promoter. To be a creative success, you need to be recognized as one. A prominent promoter already has credibility and is willing to share it with you. Not only does this benefit you, it also benefits the promoter, who now has access to fresh ideas that help keep them at the right point on the creative curve. The best innovators know that creative success is not a solo adventure, and also know that a single key partner is insufficient. We all need in our orbits a community of people who will fill a variety of roles. An important aside. Unfortunately, the importance of the creative community also makes it harder for women and minorities to find recognition in creative fields. In all my research, the list of top entrepreneurs, artists, chiefs, and other creative people were dominated by white men. One study done by USC's Annenberg School for Communication found that 414 major Hollywood studio productions, 85% of them had directors and 71% of screenwriters were male and 87% of directors were white. Clearly, something is wrong. One response to this inequity is The Blacklist, a media company named in reference to the Hollywood screenwriters of the McCarthy era, many of whom were blacklisted as suspected communists and therefore unable to find work. The company has two main services. 
They started in 2005 with the creation of an annual list of the industry's best unproduced screenplays. The list is based on surveys of Hollywood executives. To date, more than 300 of the scripts on the blacklist have been turned into feature films, including Slumdog Millionaire, The King's Speech, and Spotlight, which in turn have generated over $26 billion in box office revenue. In addition, the blacklist now has a website where screenwriters can submit their screenplays, which are in turn rated by professional reviewers. When screenwriters submit a script, they can choose to add their race and gender. The site's professional reviewers aren't privy to this data, but the blacklist also publishes a report that compares the screenwriters' races and genders with the ratings their scripts received. The data found no meaningful difference in scripts ratings, script ratings based on either race or gender. In fact, female writers actually scored slightly higher than their male counterparts did. Yet, as I mentioned, the industry is dominated by white men. Clearly, something structural prevents diverse voices from breaking through in creative fields in the way they should. My guess is it has to do with an absence of a creative community. In a world where people seek out those who look, talk, and think like them, it can be a tough climb for women and minorities to find enough people to fill out their own creative communities. Still, there's hope. The combination of awareness and tools like the blacklist are creating progress says Franklin Leonard, who founded the website, quote, The Blacklist tries to contribute to this change both by expanding the pipeline of female writers and writers of color and by pro providing a meritocratic system of discovery. Uh, end quote. Leonard adds that there are also capitalist reasons for change. Quote, Change is happening, driven largely by the dawning realization that producing films from and by women and people of color is and has always been, great for business, end quote. As you build your own creative community, remember that surrounding yourself with a diverse set of people not only enhances society, but also enhances your own creativity. I talked about the myths that have permeated creativity stories, the science of the creative curve, and three, and three of the laws for mastering the creative curve. To explain the final law, I want to take you into the flavor lab of one of the world's most beloved and delectable brands. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.